Have you ever just had one of those days when you, when you wake up and you just have a sore neck because you slept in an awkward position or after spending 10 minutes in front of the mirror, you've resigned yourself that it's going to be a bad hair day? I have not had one of those for a while. Or you grab your cup of coffee and eventually you spill it all over yourself or your boss or your teacher or your parent decides that today would be the great day to have a talk about your future, whether or not you have one. I mean, it's those kinds of days that make us all just want to run home, lock ourselves in a room, and binge watch Netflix and eat an entire package of Oreo cookies dunked in milk. Or maybe you've had a day that's just a little bit rougher. A loved one has recently died, or you've been given bad news from the doctor. Perhaps you've lost your job, or you just don't know how you're going to make ends meet. Maybe you're worried about your future, or your kid's future, or a relationship that's strained, and and you wonder yourself, how am I going to deal with all of this? How am I going to keep going? Now, as a pastor and as a husband, as a father, as just a person, I have wrestled with these questions for years. I have dealt with my own personal struggles, with family struggles, relationship struggles. I've walked with people as they have faced difficult situations and personal tragedies. And out of our own pain and confusion and discomfort, we often ask, why? We ask why as a kind of demand from the messenger or the change maker to explain themselves, to justify the pain and the discomfort and the confusion that they're putting us through. Or there's that deeper sense of our own loss and our own pain, and the more that happens, the more demanding our why becomes. And to be honest, over the years and over the struggles, I have never been able to answer the why for every situation or in a sensible manner for every person. But over the years, I've come to learn that maybe why is the wrong question to ask. Or perhaps maybe why is the wrong word from our vocabulary. Over the years, I've discovered a different word that perhaps we should focus on. So when I face challenges or when I'm working with others who are facing their own challenges, I I focus on a word that's different than why. I focus on the word through. T-H-R-O-U-G-H, through. It happens to be one of my favorite words in the entire Bible. Some people have a favorite verse. I have a favorite word. And while it does appear about 549 times through Scripture, I'm referring to how the word through is specifically used in Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That word through just jumps off the page or the screen for me. But before we get to that word through, let's leave it up there for a second, Jared. Let's dissect it a little bit. Notice it doesn't say at the beginning, if I walk through the darkest valley. It says, even though I walk. That word, though, carries with it an expectation that the dark valleys will happen. It carries the assumption that valleys are a normal way of life. It carries the idea that there is no other way. There's no other detour through that valley. And then pay close attention to the word walk. The darkest valley is not a place where we camp out. It's not a place where we stop and we behold the beauty of our pain. It's not a place where we're called to rest. The valley is a place of movement. And that just leads me to my favorite word, through. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, it takes all of that together, that inevitability, that movement, and it reminds me that the valley is not my destination. The valley is not the ending point for me. It is a part of life that I know I will eventually get through. 
And how do I personally get through? I get through by being reminded that God is with me, that God protects and provides me comfort. I get through the valleys as an act of faith. So over the next few weeks, we're going to explore how to get through the dark valleys. And today we're going to begin by starting small. You see, our culture constantly pressures us that we have to do something big for our world in order to get noticed. You've heard the phrase, go big or go home. Big, extraordinary moments, however, are very rare in life. They are much rarer than the small, ordinary moments of life. Trying to go big all the time only ends up in adding stress and frustration to your life. So what if you were to start small? So when I'm working with people who are going through those dark valleys the conversation eventually gets around to the fact that they acknowledge they just don't seem to have enough faith to deal with whatever is right in front of them. Or they say to me that they need more faith or something along those lines. And I usually respond with the question, so tell me, how much faith do you need to have to handle this particular situation? And I usually get the same response. It's usually that they need to have a lot of faith or at least more than they have at that moment. So I ask a follow-up question. How much faith is needed according to what's found in the different books of the Bible? Now, those who are familiar with the Bible will point out stories to me of, of people who have a great amount of faith, and those who aren't familiar with the Bible just stare at me. Yeah, just like that. You're doing great. So I point both people to the parable of the mustard seed. It's a parable that's found in both Mark chapter 4 and in Matthew chapter 17. So the Mark passage tells us the size of the mustard seed. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Very tiny. I don't know if you can even see it between the photo's fingers. But then Matthew goes on to tell us how much faith we actually need. In Matthew, Jesus has sent the disciples out to perform miracles and they aren't able to do it. And they come back to to Jesus and they ask, hey, why weren't we able to do this? You told us we could. And Jesus says, well, it boils down to faith. And he says to them, for truly I tell you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. These two passages reveal so much to me. My biggest takeaway is at first, appearances can be deceiving. Great things can come from humble origins. If you know anything about plants, which I do not, so I had to Google it, the mustard plant is a weed in the Middle East. Now, most weeds just spring from the ground and they spread out widely, but the tiny mustard seed, what it does is it just shoots a root forth and it searches the ground for nourishment. Now, while other seeds, weeds uh, sprout up quickly and are gone within a single season, the slow and steady growth of the mustard seed continues on for generations. And the same is true for our faith. Our faith can start small, but it can also continue to grow and be evident for generations. And it's this growing faith that will help us through our dark valleys. How much faith do you need to have? Just the size of a mustard seed. If you can summon up that much faith, you have enough. But we're also called to grow it. So how do we grow our faith? I just want to suggest five ways today. Keep it easy. The first way we grow our faith is to decide that you want to make your faith a top priority. Making making God a top priority isn't easy and it doesn't come naturally because we have a lot of competition for our attention. So we have to make a conscious 
decision to make God that priority. So ask yourself today, do I really want to make God first in my life? Be honest. Ask yourself, what do I have to truly give up if I'm going to put God first? What would I have to do that I may not want to do? What would I have to change? And am I willing to make those changes? And once you have decided that that's what you want to do, then then get the resources you need. Once you decide that you're all in, gather resources. There's a lot of good places to start. Prayer and praying is a good place to start. If you don't know what to to pray, there's resources for that. Having a Bible is a good place to start. But think, what else do I need? What resources do I need to overcome the particular obstacles in my life? And to decide that, perhaps take an inventory. What struggles are you dealing with right now? What hurts or hang-ups from the past are still affecting you today? What is holding you back from really committing? What areas do you feel like you don't know enough that you should? There are tons of great resources out there. You just have to find them. And if you don't know where to look, you just have to ask. And then surround yourself with others who motivate you. For me, one of the best motivators is to be around people who I want to be like, people who bring out the best for me. That works for me in the area of my faith life, and for those of you who know that I run, it works for me in my running life. I have people in my life who daily ask me about my spiritual journey and how it's going and what they can do to help. I have people who ask me daily how my running and my training is going. So think to yourself, what kind of influences are around you? Who are you surrounding yourself with? Who do you spend most of your time with? And do they bring out the best in you? Do they encourage you to grow in your faith? I am convinced that our faith grows the most when we take intentional times to surround ourselves with a small group of people who encourage that growth in faith. And then fourth, establish good habits and routines. Christianity is primarily based, yes, on faith and belief, but you do have to take action. We don't just wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to be a Christian and then fall back to sleep. No, being a Christian requires that eventually perhaps we may need to act like Christians. That means practicing practical personal disciplines like praying and reading the Bible and participating in worship and serving others. And none of these practices are particularly difficult, but they take time. And you have to force yourself sometimes until you make them habitual. It's like exercising. Be honest. People really don't like to exercise. At least perhaps the first few times they try it. I don't like to run every day. But once you get into the habit, once you see the benefits that come from doing something every day, once you begin seeing those positive results, then you want to make it a habit. And you can do that with your faith life by perhaps waking up 15 minutes early just to read your Bible or joining a Bible study or conversation group or setting an alarm on your phone to, prote- to pray every day at a particular time or we're even going to help you today, are we? If you look in the announcements of your bulletin, we're providing you every week with a mustard seed devotional of just simple ways that you can grow your faith this week. So that means... I don't know if I can believe I'm saying this. Don't recycle this. Take it home. We'll tell you how to use it as a guide. But finally, remember why you want to do all of this. No matter how many tips or tricks you use to make your Christian walk easier, there's no guarantee that it's going to be easy. I mean, regardless of how strong you think your faith is, we will always encounter trials and heartaches along the way, so we need to stop and remember why we are doing this in the first place. Why are we Christians in the first place? I'm not a Christian because it's easier. 
I'm not a Christian because it's convenient. I'm not a Christian simply because it's a good idea. I'm a Christian because of the love that God and others have shown to me. I'm a Christian because of the love of Jesus that he has shown to me. I am constantly reminded, constantly reminded that God walks with me even through and especially through those dark valleys. So think about that mustard seed parable. These are very unlikely representations of God's kingdom and of faith. I mean, I even learned yesterday that it takes 25 mustard seeds lined up in a row to make an inch. That's how tiny they are. So let's not try to make this something bigger than it actually is. The tiny mustard seed is not an image of strength. It's a sign of faith. Faith that God can use the smallest and frailest, the slowest and weakest, the fastest and strongest to get us through the dark valleys. Let us pray.